He's worthy. Psalm 149, last verse. I meant 150, last verse says, if you breathe, then praise him. So regardless of how we feel tonight, we need to praise him anyway. Amen. Because when we can still look around in spite of all of our feelings, he's still a good God. A wonderful, wonderful, good God. If you feel like it, stand with us. Praise the Lord.
Thank God. All be open but the shackles. Praise the Lord. I still love Revelation 21, 3 and 4, don't you? Amen. Going to get to see his face. No more death, no sorrow, no sighing, no pain. Amen. It's going to be a happy time. And it's going to happen. Just as sure as he come, hallelujah, the first time he's coming again the second time. Glory to God. And I thank him and I praise him. Welcome. Glad to have all of you tonight. We thank the Lord for you. Wish the house was full, but you're here and we're here and I know the Lord's here. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to take prayer requests at this time first, but uplifted hands, do you have a request? Yes. Any outspoken request on my right over here? Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, Elizabeth. Yeah. I see that John the Baptist is still his um, regards to him. got a special request tonight. The Lord knows all about it. Linda, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing no more important than prayer and reading God's Word. They go together. Amen. Fasting, praying, reading the God's Word. If you don't read it, you won't know how to claim his promise. Amen. You won't know what's in it. You know, real quick, like, Daniel knew that he could face death. He knew the lion's den. But he still prayed three times a day. Amen. Raised his window, looked out toward Jerusalem. And prayed three times a day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said they wouldn't bow down to the image. God told them not in the commandments not to. And they wouldn't. And they knew it could be done. But God delivered them from the fire. In the fire. Amen. They got in the fire, but he got them out of the fire. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And Daniel got in the lion's den, but he was delivered from the lion's den. God don't always take us out of our heartaches and troubles and disappointment. But folks, as one that's been in it many, many years, and I'm as human as anybody else, I still know he'll bring you out just in time. Amen. And I thank him. Would you stand with us? Brother Ricky, would you leave it? Oh, you want to be annoyed I didn't hear that. Praise the Lord. Yes. Brittany, would you get me a cheer, baby?
something. He is my refuge. He's a strong and high tower. I can call upon him and I feel his presence right then. I don't have to go pay somebody to make me feel good. I can lift my hands to him and know that he is going to take care of me. He's my strong tower. He's the one I go to. Roland can't do but so much for me. I got to call on the Lord. I got to get to myself somewhere and say, God, I need you. And he comes to our rest. There's nothing that the Lord can't do. I know I've run some of y'all ragged with prayer requests this week, but let me tell you, that's all I know to do is to call on the Lord, call on these prayer warriors that know how to get in touch with God. You know, my work sends me messages. Call your church. Get those people that you get to pray for you. Get them to pray. Because they know we got some prayer warriors in here. I love the Lord. I'm so glad that I can call upon his name. And he comes to my rescue. I, I feel something up here, brother. I don't know who's preaching tonight, but it's powerful. Hallelujah. David said he was what? The Lord is what? My shepherd. Shepherd looks out for the sheep, don't he? Amen. Shepherd's got a strong, a big, long staff, and it only fights the enemy off. But sometimes that staff, when that sheep get fall down in the crack or something, or he couldn't reach it with his arms, He'll put it in there and gently take it and put it in his arms. Yeah. Amen. I thank God he's my shepherd. He's my strong tower. He's my buckler and my shield. My exceeding great reward. Glory to God, glory to God. You know, I come to the house of God tonight not by feeling. I really didn't. But I come by faith. You all hear me? By faith to be with people of like precious faith. To get my, get fed up. Praise the Lord. I'm human. And the enemy has surely, surely tried, tried us today. We didn't, we, when we were saying, I don't want no pity. We went, I, I just want prayer. We went to two doctors today. And let me just say, it wasn't what I wanted to hear. But I still know that God's greater than the doctor. Amen. He's greater than the circumstances. He's the great I am. Hallelujah. He's never failed me yet. And he's not going to fail me now. Praise the Lord. Brother Rick. When you think of a refuge, a refuge is a place of safety. I've got a saltwater aquarium at my house, and I... I've got several tanks tied to my system, and one system is called a refugium. And in that little tank, you got all these little critters, little what they call microfauna, that lives inside that area. And they're completely safe from everything else. If they go into my main display where my fish are at, the predators come after them. They will eat them. That's the predator's source of food, if you will. And so as long as they stay in that place of refuge, they're safe from anything that can come and harm and get to them. And I didn't understand refuge until I got into involved in that hobby. I, I didn't understand exactly what a refuge can do. And, and you can go in there at night and shine a light and there's just thousands and thousands of thousands of little creatures in that one little place. And you can go in where the predators is at and you don't see. You see victims everywhere. And tonight, if you want God to be your place of refuge, you have to put yourself in that place. 
And just as the pastor said, by reading, by fasting, by praying, by coming to church, and bringing in needs and petitions to the house of the Lord. In the old Bible, if somebody was in trouble, and it, it didn't matter what law that they broke, if they could get into the house of the Lord and get a hold of the horns of the altar, there was safety in that place. They couldn't come and drag them out and convict them. They couldn't come and kill them or stone them or whatever the law commanded. It was a place of safety. And tonight the house of God can be a place of safety. For no matter what circumstances that we, we find ourselves in, no matter where we, what the doctors may say or, or what's going on in our house or going on in our jobs or wherever that it may be going on, the Lord is always a refuge, but you've got to be willing to call on him to be that. He's not going to force himself into your life. He's going to allow you the opportunity to seek him. And we all face these things. Today was the pastor's turn. Tomorrow may be your turn. But even at the worst that we go through in this life, always remember that the Lord is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our shield. He's our buckler. He's, my sister saying, he's my high tower. He's the one that's going to fight the battle for us if we let him fight the battle for us. Too many times we say, Lord, I got this. Lord, I don't need you right now. You remember some time back I preached about the spare tire? He's not your spare tire. You don't need him just when you need him. And a lot of times that favor of the Lord comes from service to the Lord and commitment to the Lord and not just calling on him when you need him, but calling on him every day. Tonight I've done something that I haven't done in a long, long, long time. And that's write some notes down. A few, few uh, about a month and a half ago, I preached a, a sermon, and we we come from Revelation 21, and I read verse four, and I'll read it again just for sake of memory. It says, "And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away." But verse five is where one where I want to start from tonight. It says, "And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold." I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So the imagery we have, when, the, when this is said, versus where we at now, there's a, there's a time period between that. It's not happening today. It's going to happen. That's one of the promises that we've got for living this life for Christ. But one thing that we had been promised in Scripture was that if you call yourself by my name, if you live by this standard, you're going to suffer persecution, you're going to face trials, you're going to go through heartaches, you're, you're going to go through this life. And we got too many that wants to candy coat it and say that you're never going to have trouble, never going to have problems. The doctors, if, if they want to label it to some sin somewhere, if you've got troubles in your life. And we like to quote these scriptures, but we got to understand that it's going to take some time to get to that point for the Lord to make all things new. Yes, we can only imagine what it's going to be like to where we don't have to worry about the things that we worry about in this life. The things that, that we suffer through in this life and the rejections that we get and, and the, the disappointments that we, we face in this life and the heartache and the grief. You, you, you listen to all these things and, and you see that, that society as a whole is going through a lot, especially when it's changing like it is now. And one word that I want you to think about tonight is bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. When you think of bankruptcy come into mind, first thing you think of is somebody losing their money for some reason and they don't have money anymore and can't pay their debts. And that's something that a lot of people faces, but I want you to read the definition of bankruptcy. It says the state of being completely lacking in a particular area. 
That's the definition of bankruptcy. It also says unable to pay debts and your belongings are taken to try to pay those debts. So we know the story. Who paid our sin debt? Jesus. And when we think about bankruptcy tonight, I, when, I, when I, the Lord said just he put bankruptcy in my spirit, and I started dwelling on this, and I got to thinking about it, and it reminded me back when I was a, a very young kid, and I was in our Royal Ranger program in our church. And there was, there was different points and teaching topics that they instilled in each young kid's life. And it was, it was the code. It was the, it was the thing that they had to teach from and the, the guideline in which it was met. And I want to read you this. It, it was four phases of a child's development. One was physical. One was spiritual. One was mental. And one was social. And if when we, when, we, when we raise our kids, we try to hit all of those areas if you keep them in church and keep them involved. Me and Brother David was talking today, and we talked about the generation that's here now. They don't emphasize bringing your family to church. They don't emphasize bringing your children to church. And, and what it creates is it creates a gap in their life. We don't come to church to produce numbers we come to church to to benefit the christian to grow the christian to to allow somebody what they need in their life to hear from the from the lord so that it can touch all four aspects of what we're speaking of here and if you look in the uh, an adult's life they they too need these principles these phases for us to grow as a christian from a physical standpoint, we've got health issues. We've got things that people go through through suffering of, of loss of loved ones and, and the different things that affects us in our body. And when you get things that affects us in our body, it also affects our mind, the mental capacity to withstand whatever that it is that you're going through. It's not always joy. There's, there's heartache that comes with this. There's concerns that happens in our life. And, and these are things that as humans we, we have to face that. And, and just standing alone on our own two feet, we can't conquer everything that we face. That's why we call on Jesus. That's, that's why we pray. That's why we read our Bible. It's not just to be able to regurgitate scriptures and, and be able to give catchy little one-liners. It's, it's to help us in our life. How many times have you read scripture and, and you go to talk to somebody or somebody's talking to you and, and the Lord will bring back a scripture that will be fitting for whatever's going on in your life or the times that we read the word of God and, and we see that that one scripture is just what you needed just at the right time. Or it could be coming through a song that's, that's ministering something to the Lord, maybe a praise song, and all of a sudden because you, you yield to that and you next thing you know your hands are in the air the tears are streaming and you're calling out and you're crying out to the Lord because everything was just right at that moment and that helps us mentally and if we can be helped mentally then we can also be helped spiritually the areas that people lack so much is growth in the spirit growing in the Lord and I'm not talking about spiritual stuff like just speaking in tongues and having a good prayer language and, and all of these things. That's not the spirituality that I'm talking about. I'm talking about what you've got on the inside that's, gonna, that's not of this world. It's a confidence. It's faith in God. And it's, a, it's an ability to go through whatever that we face and standing on the Lord's promises. The pastor just said that you're not going to know what the Lord's promises are unless you in the Word of God studying it and learning it for yourself. Christians suffer from reading comprehension. They can read it, but they don't retain it. They can read it, but they don't understand it. 
and they, have, they feel like they've got to go to somebody to be able to grab a hold of what's being said in the Word of God. But the Word of God is given for ministers and teachers and, and people to, to present the gospel and, and to help others, but it's also there for us to learn this for ourselves. And sometimes instead of getting into the complexities of, of prophecy and the complexities of just using the book of Revelation for an example, one of the first things I did when I got saved was jump into the book of Revelation and try to figure it all out. And guess what? I didn't understand all of it. Why? Because I didn't have the basic parts of it down. And I didn't, didn't listen to what the Lord was was. was pushing me in the direction he wanted me to go to learn about him. Because the best thing that we can do in this life is to learn about God's love and learn about why he hung on that cross and to learn about what life is going to be for us because he paid that sacrifice. And then we've got to learn how to navigate things in this life. And that's where faith scriptures come in. That's where we, we start gleaning just little things out of the scriptures. It, I, the preachers mention this, and I've known people that, that they say, well, I read the Bible in a year. One year. Well, whoop-de-doo. Because what good does that do you? you I, ever, all, all of us, if you've got any kind of study Bible, it tells you how many chapters, how many verses, what you've got to do every day for that entire year to be able to read the Word of God. And I'm telling you right now, you are wasting your time except to say, I read the Bible in a year. Because you're not getting what you need. I've told the Sunday school class back when I was helping Lana, and I've said it from the pulpit, there's times where I get on one verse, and I may not leave that one verse for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Sometimes I go back to it for months and months and months to, to be able to dig in and get, that's what Word of God is, is there for, church. It's for us to dig in. You take John 3.16. The most well-known verse in the entire Bible, everybody's heard that verse. All of us can probably quote that verse. But do you understand what that verse says? Do you understand the depth there is in what that verse was, was telling us? Take the account of Nicodemus when he was speaking to Jesus. And he was asking him these questions. And, and Jesus was explaining that it was necessary to be born again. And Nicodemus did not understand that. And he, he, he was a, a ruler. He, he knew the law. He, he memorized the law. He, he understood the, 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 the wording of it. And he understood the, the historic aspect of it. But he didn't understand what grace was all about. He didn't understand the need for forgiveness and the requirement of a change in order for us to make it to heaven. And today our churches are infested infested with, with people that, that they think that they can live like hell and still make it to heaven. That there's no penalty for sin. That there's no, there's no judgment that can be given because I had an emotional experience with the Lord that everything's okay. And that is a lie perpetuated by the enemy himself. Because when, when I looked at this, I, I jotted down some areas here for, for kids. Let's look at kids for a minute. Major things that influence their lives is social media. That is a number one thing. Me, my wife and I went somewhere the other day and they had an advertisement and it blew me away. What one of the things, it was, a, it was like an, a, a warning to the parents for, what's, for influencers. That's what they call them. They're, they're people that, that these social media platforms, they will pay these people to promote some kind of brand. And it creates false images. And especially in the younger generation, they, they look at these people and they desire for their life to be like them. And these people, they get paid 
to tell them this stuff to what makes them look beautiful or, or what makes their hair do certain things. And, and one of the things that really stuck out, and I looked at Cindy, I said, is that true what happened? Was that, that this young, one young lady was telling kids about how to whiten their teeth? And to use nail files to file down the, the top coating on their teeth to make their teeth look whiter. I want that to sink in for a minute. What are you kids learning by that? De destroying their body. You don't grow another set of teeth. And I'm sure that one of my kids come home and say, well, I filed my teeth down and I got to go pay the dentist bill. They're going to have a sore rear end as they're going to the dentist to get their teeth fixed. But yet that's, that's just one little tiny thing. You read about accounts of, of bullying for the kids on social media. And kids can be cruel. Adults can be cruel and kids can be cruel. And they, they, they find people in school they don't like, they pick on them, and, and they tell them, why don't you just go kill yourself? And one thing about the, the social standpoint that I'm speaking of is everybody wants to be accepted. Raise your hand if you don't want to be accepted. We want to be accepted in our church. We want to be accepted in our families. We, we want to be accepted on our jobs and, and all of this. And that's one thing that, that especially the young kids as they're going through school, they want to be accepted. And, and if they're not accepted, then, then it puts a target on their back. They don't have that refuge that we're speaking about. And I remember back when I was, a, uh, I was in the middle school and I had just started, and I, we, we went into the cafeteria, and I was taught to, to say the blessing over my meal. And I did that. Didn't understand why, because I was still little, but it was something that was ingrained into my life. And so I sat down at the table, and one of the ladies from my church, she, she seen me from across the cafeteria, and she seen when I bowed my head and said my blessing, and she said, you were the only one in that whole group that did that. Why? Because I was taught that. It was part of my makeup. It was, it was part of, of Brother David because I was made to go to church, and, and these are the things that we learn at church that you're thankful to God for, for every blessing that he gives you in this life. You, you're thankful for everything that he does, and, and if the devil can disconnect that kind of mindset in a young person, he can disconnect that mindset in you as well. And you remember what I, what I said about bankruptcy, the first definition a state of being completely lacking in a particular area. So if, you, if you're lacking in the physical, spiritual, mental, and social, in one of those areas, it, it, you're not a complete person when that takes place. And it doesn't mean that you have to stay in that state. Because when, you, when, you, when we look at God and how he operates and the works that the Lord does for us in our lives and, and how he helps us through the day by day, I want to tell you something. Your trial today, the suffering that you're enduring today, the, the heartache that you feel today, it puts a callus in this flesh, but tomorrow it's going to be your testimony because, listen to me, when you go through these things in life and the Lord's helping you the next time that it comes up and you face a trial similar to that, you've got strength to stand on. You've got something that you can go to and fall back on. You, It is a learned thing for humanity that the trusting God, no matter what we face our, ourselves with, we have to trust God. And if we can't trust God, then who can you trust? Who can you turn to to help you through what you are facing? As my sister said, Roland can only take her so far. The doctor can only take you so far. Your psychiatrist can only take you so far. That bottle of nerve pills, the antidepressants or whatever it is, it can only take you so far. 
And some of the people that I encounter on a daily basis, they are so bankrupt in their life, church, that they resort to anything that they can find to feel that need, that thing that's going on in their life, or help push them away from the situation to where they just, they're numb to it for just a little while. And that is the treachery of what the enemy does to those that don't have Jesus Christ in their heart. How many times have, have I told you we live way below our privilege? We live way below what we've got available to us, church. And it's because people don't want to commit to that. If they wanted to commit to that, if they wanted to get what they want from the Lord, they would be in the house of God. They would be on the prayer chains that go out. They would be calling and they would be asking for these things, but everybody feels like they're okay. In the Bible, you, you read of Jesus encountering people that were possessed by devils. Under demonic influence, children throwing themselves in fire. You got people that were maniac and they, they couldn't even bind them up with chains to, to hold them down. The devil had that much control in their life. And the Lord would deliver them from that. But let me, let me explain something to you. Just because you're saved, and just because you may be filled with the Holy Ghost, and just because you may be a prayer warrior and a, a Bible scholar and a student or a preacher or a teacher or piano player or whatever, it does not keep you from government coming under demonic influence, demonic oppression. Because when Job had everything going on, and the devil called God out and said, look, I can't get to him because you've got all of this around him. God had enough trust in Job that he could take all of these comforts out of his life and that he wouldn't, that, that he wouldn't fail God. Are we strong enough to know that in our lives that, that God can remove his hedge from about us and every devil force in this world come against us and oppress us and try to beat us up and try to tear us down? Listen, that enemy is after you tonight. And he's going to come at you in your senses. He's going to come at you in your weakness. He's going to come at you in the, the, the deficiencies that are in your life. And with these four points that I spoke, if one of them are deficient in the Lord, he's going to attack you in that and try you. And if we succumb to it, that's, that's all he's looking for is his opportunity. That's all he's waiting on. He plays a long game, church. A long game. And he's waiting on us to mess up in some area, waiting on us to mess up in some way. He's looking for the opportunities that, that we would skip a day of calling on the Lord, missing out on church when we could have went and we just were lazy. He's missing on the opportunities of, of whenever you see somebody else in need and that, that we don't reach out to them or we don't offer them our help or, as the Word said, give them a, a cold glass of water, if you will. When we miss out on these things, these are areas that the enemy can attack us in and keep us huffed up and puffed up and mad and, and all of this stuff at one another. I don't know very many in here that didn't come from another church. This church was founded on leaving another church for whatever reason. It doesn't matter what reason. But yet we see that, that there's something that causes that. And I've always wondered why, why this group thinks they're better than that group and that group thinks that they're better than that group. And whenever the world looks at it, they look at the church as being a hot mess. hot mess because when the rubber meets the road we denominations don't get along with each other when we're all supposed to be following a blood-bought savior and it makes me wonder what jesus thinks about that what does the lord think about that i don't care what they think about it i want to know what the lord thinks about that why 
because I want his favor. I want his blessing. And I'm not so entrenched and so dogmatic that, that I can't see the need for a world ripe with harvest. And, and if we're getting caught up in all of the things that are going on out there, we're, we're going to be a part of what needs to be harvested, not one's harvesting. It doesn't matter if our church isn't bumper to bumper full and to capacity. Because I would rather have the congregation that, that needs the Lord, not just a bunch of people there to, to be a cheering section or, or a, a, what they can get out of it or, or the entertainment value of, of being around the holiness church. I, I want people that are going to learn about the Lord and, and better their lives. So people like my sister Linda, I'm using her a lot tonight so that she can put words out into the prayer chain and like she said, know that people are going to get on their face before God and call out to what that need is. That they'll respond when the all call goes out to say such and such needs prayer and stop what they're doing and and start calling on the Lord right then. I would much rather for that to happen. You see, they, the kids, they got star influences. They got peer pressure. And another deficiency that they have is parental guidance. Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel are raising a lot of kids. Tablets and games are raising a lot of kids. A lot of kids. Interaction with, with, with people. Not learning that. You see, for, for even for adults that are, are vested in social media, invested in social platforms, it builds this image that you're somebody. You can get on there and say the right words and do the right things and people will look at you as, 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 as somebody that's, that's got wisdom and got knowledge when in turn they're just sitting in their basement somewhere and just as lost as Hogan's goat. Hmm? Those influencers that are influencing our children, they're, they're spiritually bankrupt. They're depraved. They don't understand the mind of God. They don't understand the workings of the enemy. In order for you to wage war, you've got to have intelligence on the enemy. You've got to know what that enemy's position is and, and where that enemy is going to try to attack. And you've got to stay ahead of that enemy in order to defeat that enemy. If, if you just sit still and keep yourself boxed in, you can't be in a stalemate in this world anymore the army of God needs to be moving forward we need to be marching by the same beat the same drum and following what the command of God is and not what the world thinks about it and we have to be careful with all of these things because if we're not careful, the enemy does. And, and when we get caught up in a fake reality, and unfortunately for, I'm not saying that it is in this church, but some churches, it creates a fake reality because I belong to this big name evangelist church and, and all of this, and they follow the people, they follow the man. I, I give you an example. I, I had an uncle years ago that they give his heart to the Lord. And he did it under one certain person's ministry. And when he gave his heart to the Lord, he followed that man. And that man got caught in, a, in an adulterous relationship with one of the people in the church. And when that man failed, he moved away. And because that man, that influence of that man, my uncle left the Lord and backslid. Because he was looking at the wrong thing. He was looking at the wrong one. And it's took many, 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 many years for him to overcome that, and he's still not overcome that. And that's what I'm trying to express tonight. The Bible tells us for you, not me, to do it for you, not the pastor to do it for you. But he says for you to work out your own salvation. Your own, your own walk with God. 
your own baseline basis with God, for you to do that, that you've got to work that out, not to be handed to you, not to be gifted to you, not to be, to be presented to you for an inheritance or whatever. You have to work out your own salvation. And he said, do it with fear and trembling. What is the thing that you should be scared of working out your own salvation? Missing heaven. Missing heaven. Because if we're not careful, we can let a situation or a circumstance dominate our life and control our mood. Our, our, uh, we can get church hurt. We can get family hurt. We can get job hurt. We can get, get somebody can say something wrong or not. Li listen to me. How many times could it be somebody over here looks over there and they, this one over here sees in over there and think they're giving them the stink eye. Next thing you know, this one over here decide, well, I'm not coming back to church tomorrow or next week or next month because Sister Betty looked at me and I know what she was thinking. You guilty of that, Betty? Okay. But it's just that kind of thing that can, that can mess up the flow of a church. Uh, this morning on Facebook, they, uh, Caleb put out, what's the thing that would cause a church to grow? Love is one thing, but unity. The church was born from those 120 people being in one mind and one accord. They had a purpose. They had a mission. They were waiting for the Lord waiting for the promise to come from the Lord. What's the name, the name on our church? The first word is what? United. United vision. And if the church is in this state, this community, this area, if we could unite for the same purpose, the, 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 the harvest of souls would be significant. Just because the 120 were united, when Peter come out of that upper room and started preaching, Thousands were saved. The next day, thousands were saved. And they never quit working towards that as long as they kept that unity. And in that unity is love, brother. And it's everything that, that we fit into what a Christian is supposed to be, Christ-like. We sit on our, our, our high horses sometime and we, we pronounce condemnation on people and judgment on people because they don't fit what mold that we think that they should fit. And we have to be careful of those things because if we're not careful, you run people away. And I can promise you that we can go through our lives and if the, 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 our heart was opened up, you see so much deficiency out there, it would scare you to death. Because we all struggling with this flesh, church. We all struggling with, with the, the, the salvation aspect and, and learning about our salvation and ever growing in the Lord. And, and again, the enemy's always there pressing on us. Always pressing on us. In our thoughts, in our dreams, in our lives, in our jobs. And, and it, it just sometimes it becomes overwhelming, church. It truly does. But that's when we've got to dig in, not give up. Quitting is for the enemy. That's for the enemy. Because again, I read to you, and he sat upon the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And if we want to see what that newness is, we've got things we've got to do to get to that point. You've got to put gas in the car to drive. You've got to keep the car maintained. Sometimes we may even have to get a new car because the old one gets wore out. But yet we still want to go in that, that general direction. I, I got one more scripture here that I want to read to you. 2 Timothy th chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine and manner of life, purpose, long-suffering, faith, charity, and patience persecutions, afflictions which came into me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Can we say that same thing, church? 
tell me somebody when God has failed you. I'll open the floor to that right now. When has God failed you? When have you failed God? I like that word a lot because we all have done it. It says in verse 12, Yea, and all, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to suffer it. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul was not painting a pretty picture for, for what's to come, what's going on. Because there's evil men out there, church, evil people that, that tell our children to take nail files and file their teeth down to, to make them white. They, they influence them and confuse them about what gender that they are. And We've got evil men that's, that's trying to push agendas like this in our school systems and you've got churches that are succumbing to that kind of mindset and that kind of doctrine and you've got churches that are watering down the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're trying to remove all the penalty of sin to where the people cannot work out their own salvation because they're learning that there's nothing there to work out, church. Parents are, are, are empty in not teaching their children about the Lord and teaching them about the love of Jesus and, and telling them about the goodness of the Lord. Listen, there's enough in this world that's bad. We don't need to be bad. We need to be part of the solution and not a part of the problem. So when we, when we look at these things, let's always understand that, yes, the enemy's there, but that we've got the one on, in our heart that's going to overcome that. And even though it may take us out of this world, even though we may be bankrupt physically, even though that we might be lacking in that one particular area, that we're going to be rich in the Lord. That's why in the Beatitudes he said, you'll have the poor with you always, always. But that you bless it if, you, if you're strong in righteousness. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, look, I've kept all the commandments. I've done everything the Bible says to do. What must I, more should I do? And Jesus looked at him and said, sell everything that you've got and give it to the poor. And as hard as that man worked to get to that state to where he can have an audience with Jesus and tell him, say, Lord, I've done everything up till now. What more should I do? And Jesus said, sell everything that you got. Give it to the poor. And the Bible said that man walked away sorrowful. Because he had many possessions. And that's the same thing with Christians. A lot of Christians, they go so far in their walk with the Lord, but they just won't do what the Lord wants them to do. And you have to figure out what, that, what the Lord wants you to do. You've got to figure that out for yourself. That's part of working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because you don't want you to hold back on something of this world and it keep you out of the kingdom of God. You don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. I don't want it to happen for me, my family. I don't want it to happen for my church family. So when we're going through things, when we're facing our situations, always remember that just because you're going through that doesn't mean, it doesn't change your trajectory it doesn't change the course that you're on. Even though you may not feel churchy and feel all this stuff, that there's things that we can do to help ourselves. And that's why we get in this word. That's why we get on our face and start praying before the Lord. There's times where I'll come, when I'm having bad weeks, I'll come to this church in the middle of the day and I'll get right down here in this altar and I will bring my petitions and needs to the Lord. If I've got need and answer in my life, I seek God out for that answer. I'm willing to let him be what dictates. And I tell him all the time, when I give out estimates for my jobs and, and these things, and in my mind I, I look at some of these things that I give and know that they could change and alter my financial security. 
And yes, it's disappointing when, some, when they don't come through. But I always say, Lord, if it's your will, let this come to pass. And we should say that about everything in our life. Lord, if it's in your will, if you want me where you want me at, you want me to do, Lord, you show me the way. That's why David said that his word was a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And we need to let that take place. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, that we have you in our lives, Lord, to turn to in both the good and the bad, Father. Lord, we may lose everything in this life. We may lose our health, our wealth, Lord. We may lose our families. We, we may even lose our churches, Lord. But, Father, you the constant, and we're not going to lose you as long as we hold on, Lord. Father, I pray over every situation and every need that is in this congregation tonight, Lord. I pray over every situation and need of those that are coming in online, Father. I just ask you tonight, Lord, for a supernatural help, Father. I ask you, Lord, that you would, would reveal your plan in, in our lives, Father, not just as individuals, Lord, but also for this being your body and your will and purpose in our lives, Lord. Revive your people once again, Lord. Help us, Lord, to face what we're going to face tomorrow, Father, and in the days to come, Lord. Father, I just pray that something that has been said here tonight will help somebody, Lord. Oh, Father, I know that I've needed my part in this, Lord. And, Lord, your word stands true. And I'm going to trust you, Lord, in everything that you've said, Father. Because, Lord, I, too, am waiting on the day when you make all things new. Lord, when all the sorrows and the heartaches and the things of this life have, have passed away, Father, and sin is overcome and the enemy's overcome, Lord, and we get to spend time with you as you intended for us to spend. Lord, I'm looking for that day. But, Father, I need your help today, Lord. I need your guidance in my life today, Lord. I need you to help me, Father, and I love you and thank you for all that you do, and Father. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any testimonies? Anybody got anything they want to add? Well, I have bored you to death. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say God is good hallelujah. all the time. God is what? When? I like that. Let's wait. Give him a wave offering. Let's say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Lord, I know you're going to fight my battle. I'm going to stand true on your promise. And I'm going to live by your holy word. Enemy, I defeat you in the name of Jesus, the one that died for my sins. Amen. I feel the Lord. <laughs> That make me feel better. All hearts and minds clear. Anyone else? If not, we're going to ask you to stand. Danny, I'm going to ask you to dismiss.